What comes to mind when you think about mathematics? During my days in primary school, I would think of it as arithmetic. Numbers and the operators sum, subtract, product, and divide. At high school, formulas that we use in road learning to memorize for exams. As a professional in STEM fields, we might treat mathematics as a tool to get a job done. In general, we use mathematics to model some problem where we believe there to be a correspondence between the problem and the model. We then exploit known properties of the model to make predictions about the problem domain in return. For example, those rectangular boxes that you drew for problem sums in primary school. Or take linear regression, for example. If we model some data set to be increasing linearly, based on the properties of a sloping line, we can extrapolate more data points than what we have to make predictions. This phenomena of effective models in mathematics for problem domains happens so often that we categorize mathematical topics according to fields in STEM, such as statistics and probability for economics, harmonic analysis for engineering, discrete mathematics for computer science. This view of mathematics was not satisfying for me. There were many overlaps between the mathematics in different STEM fields, and the way they were taught was mostly as a given, without a basis or conviction why they should exist besides their unreasonable effectiveness as a tool to solve problems. When I was an, under, when I was an undergraduate, I started to grow an interest in physics due to its layers of abstractions, the lower layers providing motivation why the layers above should behave the way they do, such as how atoms and molecules explain chemistry and how chemistry explains biology. When I finally found the philosophies describing this phenomena, I started seeing them everywhere in topics that I found interesting. The philosophies are monism and reductionism, which says complex things are composed of simpler things, which explains their behavior. And there is one base layer simplest thing at the very bottom. In physics, we might say it is quantum fields, or perhaps strings in string theory, which is the base layer. In classical modern computers, it would be electrons and semiconductors at the very bottom. So you can see why, if I were to look at mathematics as just tools for solving problems, it is not convincing to me why it exists in the first place, unmotivated by a hierarchy of reductionism. In the late 1970s, a profound cross-disciplinary insight emerges with refinements over the years. It says that there is a single underlying phenomenon at the foundations of mathematics, with three different perspectives that we could interpret the phenomenon with. This phenomenon will be our base layer for mathematics in our pursuit of monism and reductionism. The three perspectives are logic, spaces, and computation. This correspondence is also known as the curry howard lambert correspondence, named after the mathematician Haskell Curry, the logician William Elvin Howard, and the mathematician Joachim Lambert, who each made the connection to a different perspective from their respective fields. In this talk, we will investigate this trinity and explore one of its implications. Computerized proofs, where mathematical inference and guarantees of rigor for a mathematical proof can be done with computer programs called theorem provers. In 1934, Gerhard Gensen came up with a system called the calculi of natural deduction. Natural deduction is a deductive system where we deduce judgments. Judgments are statements bearing some truth value for example, A prop is a judgment that says A is a proposition. The deductive system uses what are called introduction rules to create new judgments and elimination rules to draw conclusions from judgments. For example, A prop, B prop deduces A and B prop. This is known as the introduction rule for conjunction, or also known as logical end. There are two elimination rules for conjunction. Here is one of them. A and B prop deduces A prop. And we can see that with deductive systems, we could create the rules for logic. With logic being defined, we could start expressing logical statements. A collection of these statements could describe some mathematical structure. For example, the notion of a set. The standard accepted axiomatic definition of a set is called zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice, or ZFC for short. The reason we need sets in mathematics is because most definitions of mathematical structures are done in terms of sets. We could construct the natural numbers with the empty set and set construction. 
we could also construct the ordered pair where repeated elements are permitted and are distinguished by their ordering too. With that, we could define all the numbers from the integers to the complex numbers and so on. In mathematics at the undergraduate level onwards, algebras refers to algebraic structures, which are a set along with one or more operators that have certain properties called identities. These structures can be used to model problems. Examples of algebraic structures are vector spaces in linear algebra or Lie groups in physics. All of these definitions come from the humble empty set and set construction. But set theory can sometimes be more expressive and powerful than needed, and sometimes this can get in our way. In set theory, we could express meaningless and nonsensical statements such as, is the number zero a member of the number two? It only holds meaning in terms of the encoding of how we define our numbers, but it does not yield any mathematical insight or properties that is of interest to mathematicians. Now, let's explore another perspective in our trinity, spaces, or the study of category theory. Some mathematicians might call it abstract nonsense in a joking and endearing way. The field of category theory has its roots in algebraic geometry, a field using algebra to solve geometric problems. The word category here is a technical term referring to a mathematical structure, not to be confused with our colloquial use of the word. The key idea I'd like to introduce to you is the idea of a functor, which are structure-preserving maps from one structure to another. If some property exists in the category C and there is a functor F from C to D, then the property in C is preserved in D after the mapping. If you are to look at the diagram here, the arrows and notes little f, g, h, and capital X, y, z from the category C, and the way they are connected is a property of interest. The functor big F maps these constituents into category D while still preserving the way they are connected, thus preserving the property. Categories are abstractions of actual mathematical objects. Thus, to give an example, if a physicist were to use category theory, Category C and D could be manifolds modeling some notion of space-time, and the functor capital F a differentiable map. A more simplified example would be that category C is the physical land of Bukit Timah in Singapore, and category D is a topological map. The functor F maps the actual land to the map preserving distances and elevation. Take this tweet for example from John Baez a mathematical physicist working on applications of higher category theory. A good mathematician should know lots of ways of turning things into other things. They're called functors. And whenever you meet a new thing and have some functor, you can apply to it. You should give it a try. He then gives examples of functors, such as the group completion, mapping from monoids to groups, and decategorification, mapping from monoidal categories to monoids. To the uninitiated, the examples may seem dense, but the idea is that we could transform one structure to another without losing properties we are interested in. And the reason we do this is that oftentimes the structure we are mapping to is simpler to work with. In this view, we can see that mathematics is a network of mathematical structures where we can transform one structure to another. Each of the links or nodes in the network could possibly be a whole field of mathematics. Now, Let's talk about the last perspective, computation. Kevin Buzzard, professor of pure mathematics at Imperial College London, spearheaded the MathLeap project, a library of formalized mathematics, ranging from analysis, geometry, algebra, and more. It is formalized using the theorem prover Lean, launched by Microsoft Research in 2013. Underlying a theorem prover is its type theory. Lean, for example, uses a type theory called the calculus of constructions. Briefly, a type theory is a formal system that have judgments that a term is of a certain type, and you can construct new types and terms using rules of type theory. We call our trinity, proofs corresponds to types. So for example, one is the type of integers, could be interpreted as the number one is a term of the type integers, or it could also be a proof to the proposition integers. It is a constructive proof where the existence of the number one bears as witness to the existence of the integers. Thus, if you have some mathematical theorem big A and you are, to, and you are able to construct a witness little a, you have proof a theorem. 
Different type theories facilitate and restrict what we are able to express. In Lean, propositions are proof irrelevant, meaning if a proposition is true, there is only one proof. For example, in Lean, the definitional equality A equals B can only have one proof. If there are more than one proofs, then they are equal. There is a weaker notion of definitional equality, and that is equivalence, also known as an isomorphism or a bijection. Loosely, it says, if A and B are isomorphic, you can transform one to another and back without losing any information. And there can be more than one transformations from A to B and vice versa. Thus, this is a proof-relevant notion of equality in contrast to Lean's propositions. Recall what we learned in category theory. If A and B are categories, then if they are isomorphic, it would mean that there exist functors from A to B and B to A, and the mapping of one functor to the other back to back will bring you back to where you started. The univalence axiom says equivalence is equivalent to equality. This has huge implications when writing proofs in which equivalent objects can be interchanged with one another. Vladimir Voivodsky formulated the univalence program devoted to working on a type theory with the univalence axiom where mathematical structures are types. This is known as homotopy type theory, or HOT for short. The name homotopy comes from algebraic geometry. It denotes the interpretation of type theory where types corresponds to a topological space and equivalence corresponds to a path on that space between two points. This is a form of synthetic geometry where we can use types to define geometry. Here are a few examples. If we define a path where both of its endpoints are at the same point, it forms a loop, a circle. And another example, the product of two loops is a torus. And you can imagine such constructions for more complex geometric objects. So now that we have hot, should we not put it into practice in a theorem prover? Unfortunately, because univalence is an axiom, computational properties are not guaranteed. Loosely speaking, some programs won't be able to run. The attempt to solve this is cubical type theory, where the univalence axiom is a theorem, thus making it constructive and computable. It features higher inductive types, where terms of equality types themselves can form equality types, an infinite hierarchy of equality, an infinity groupoid structure, an infinite dimensional cube, thus its name, cubical type theory. The pursuit in HOT promises to be a new foundation where we could specify structures at the level of the computational trinity. And due to its computational nature, the computer will provide rigor in checking our definitions and formalisms. If you squint at it long enough, you might start to see that a unification of disparate parts of mathematics through computation is happening. Proofs, logic, algebra, geometry, all different views of the same structure formalized in the type theory. That to me is really cool. Cubical type theory is like a grand unified theory of mathematics, if I were to use a physics analogy. This is an active field of research that I find really amazing. It has been a self-taught journey of mine for about three years or so, and I'm sure you will find this field exciting, not just for its theoretical beauty, but its practical industrial benefits as well. Thank you.